we're speaking about maverick scholars and people being looked upon as maverick. This is usually a, a term of um, negative uh, negativity to uh, try to ostracize them in, in some way. So there are a lot of um, people writing, um, I would call them aficionados, who have taken up the cause and are publishing books on their own and through different means of uh, publishing at the moment. And this is uh, doing, uh, this is uh, making a fairly big impression on the internet. So it may turn out that what are called mavericks now and uh, generations to come, hopefully, um, can at least uh, be a counterweight to some of the scholarship. The scholarship, unfortunately, people in the field of, of uh, studying these kind of documents, gospels and uh, other uh, materials of that kind, often come from seminaries or rabbinical institutions. And very often where the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were concerned, these were people who were under authority. So you really couldn't get uh, an objective view or to go beyond a certain point from them. They were, they could go this far and no further, but they couldn't see, for instance, if you said the scrolls are really what Christianity was in Palestine, they couldn't go that far. I'm somewhat of a pessimist. I feel that the uh, authoritative documents are so authoritative in people's minds that even though new uh, points of view come into play, uh, it takes people maybe 30, 40 years of their life to develop these attitudes and uh, points of view, and it's very difficult to pass it on to a new, a new generation. So when young people or a new generation come up, they just start with the same documents that they had in the first place, and the same authoritative points of view hold, hold sway. And I'm not sure if in 2100 or 2200, we won't be looking at the same allegiances that we're seeing now. We're speaking about the Messianic movement in Palestine. I think that uh, I coined that phrase uh, maybe back in the mid-80s, 19, uh, the 1980s. Uh, because when we were looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, people were using the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, to talk about Essenes. Uh, uh, occasionally they spoke about zealots. And this was a terminology that was uh, fairly normative and it meant certain things to people. But when you looked at the scrolls themselves, uh, they were more than that. And the um, idea of an Essene as described, for instance, in the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century or his earlier contemporary Philo of, of Alexandria, also in the earlier first century, who spoke about Essenes. When you looked at these people, they were not talking about Essenes vis-a-vis -vis any um, Messiah situation. But if you look at the Qumran is the word we use to describe Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's an easier jargon, if you, it's where they were discovered. If you look at the Qumran documents, you'll see that they are full of uh, Messianic materials. Uh, they have all of the so-called messianic prophecies. Uh, they have, even have uh, collections of messianic proof texts, uh, promises, for instance, to the seed of David, and uh, things like that. So things that we've uh, come laterally after Christi Christianity came into play in the Roman Empire and Christian documents took over the Western worldview, uh, prophecies that we became familiar with as so sort of proof texts you find in these lists in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I began to call this the literature of the Messianic movement in Palestine. And that's why I use that phrase, not Essene, not Zealot, because um, uh, I don't think they call themselves Zealots. And um, we've never seen Essene used anywhere but Josephus and Philo. We, we don't even have it in the New Testament documents. So what were they calling themselves? And uh, there are many names, but I think the whole literature is the literature of, because of these messianic uh, quotes, the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine. The key prophecy uh, that we're talking about when we're speaking about the messianic movement in Palestine is usually the star prophecy. 
It's from Numbers, uh, I think it's uh, Numbers 24. Um, a star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to rule the world, etc., etc., etc. Often, for instance, in Christian uh, iconography, you see the star over Bethlehem. If you go to the catacombs in Rome, you'll see Balaam, who's the prophet in Numbers, who is supposed to have first uttered this prophecy, uh, pointing at the star uh, in, in the actual catacombs. So uh, the, the fundamental one was the star prophecy, because of this star will rise out of Jacob, a scepter to rule the world. Now this is in Josephus. Uh, Josephus says that this was capable of uh, the first century Jewish historian, of uh, multiple interpretations, and he, like rabbinic Judaism to follow him, uh, represents, let's say, the Pharisee approach. He uh, said uh, he, did, he used the most cynical interpretation. He applied it to the rise of the Roman emperor in Palestine. Uh, the Roman emperor that destroyed the Jewish uh, uh, independent state in Palestine, that uh, uh, burned the temple and so on and so forth. He said he's the world ruler that would come out of Palestine. And therefore, he, he in return, got the moniker uh, Flavius Josephus because the new emperors that came out of Palestine, the Roman generals, uh, Vespasian and Titus and so on, the arch of Titus in Rome is still a extant, uh, these people were called Flavians. So in return for his uh, cynical interpretation and sycophantism, he becomes Flavius J Josephus. But Christianity, for instance, has this star prophecy as applying to their picture of Jesus. And in the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the star prophecy is uh, referred to in at least three extant documents. One we call the Damascus document, one we call the War Scroll, and in this list of Messianic proof texts that I said. That's quite incredible to have three. And Josephus at one moment in his uh, Jewish war book says that uh, the thing that most moved the Jews to re revolt against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. So in other words, the war against Rome was a messianic war. So that's why I say that the scrolls are not only the literature of the messianic movement in Palestine, they're also the literature of the war against Rome. And you do have in this war scroll, a follow, it's in around, the scrolls are uh, divided into columns because they're read from right to left and so on in the normal Hebrew way because they're rolled on a scroll. So uh, around column 11 or so in the war scroll, you have this prophecy, and then they interpret it. And they interpret it in terms of the Messiah, and, the, and they also interpret it on, uh, in terms of the heavenly host coming on the clouds of heaven to rain judgment on all the world. Now, if you look in the New Testament, every time Jesus or John the Baptist or someone like that, in early church literature, James, the brother of, of uh, Jesus is questioned, they speak about, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, meaning with the heavenly host uh, for whatever they're supposed to do, rain judgment on, on the earth. And so I, I say that here's the war scroll giving its Palestinian version of these uh, ideas. And then in Christianity later, you have the reformulation as they're presented in the Gospels as we know them. Jews were waiting for the Palestinian star prophecy could be called the Christ? Well, can this Messiah be called the Christ? Um, the Christ is a, a very uh, ephemeral Greek uh, terminology that very few people know what it actually meant. Um, Christos in Greek can mean compassion. Uh, in some versions, I suppose it can mean anointed one. I've never seen how that actually works out because this is a very precise Greek uh, transcription. But one thing is sure, the book of Acts, which describes the development of the church in its own somewhat tendentious manner, at least the first 15 chapters, speaks around uh, 10, 11 or so on, that Christians were first called Christians in Paul's church in Antioch in northern Syria somewhere. There's a lot of discussion on which Antioch that is. I don't 
I think we need to get into that here. It's very technical, but uh, the head of the Seleucid Empire, which is where all these Antiochs were, there are at least four or five of them, uh, his father was, uh, was named An Antiochus or Antiochus. And so he named lots of cities after him. So the question is, which one are we talking about? Which Antioch is Paul's Antioch? Uh, but in any case, th that means in the mid-50s, when this is supposed to be happening in the book of Acts, Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. That means they weren't called Christians in Palestine. That means in the 30s, 40s, or whatever, certainly probably up to, because it would take quite a long time for that terminology then to permeate back into Palestine, if that's an accurate presentation, that means they weren't called Christians in, in um, Palestine until quite late, even probably until the war against Rome and thereafter. So what were they called? That's a Greek formulation. Uh, so I don't know if Christ is a, a, a perfect uh, translation of uh, Messiah or whether Christians were ever called Christians in Palestine until much later. So we have to ask, what were they called? And I think they were called, well, Messianists, perhaps, but uh, perhaps Ebionites. Ebion is the Hebrew word for poor, and the poor are mentioned in the War Scroll. The Dead Sea Scrolls call, talk about themselves in terms of the poor. Uh, the James community was called the Ebionites, the poor. The letter of James addresses the poor. And so that may have been one of the names. There's one early church historian. His name's called Hippolytus. There's a manuscript that was found attributed to him in Mount Athos in the 19th century that uh, was just recently found. We don't know if it was to him, but he has a, a version of the Jewish sects there, very much like Josephus, but slightly different than Josephus. And he speaks about there being four groups of Essenes, not one as in Josephus, but four. And two of these groups he calls Zealot Essenes and Sicarii Essenes. Now, I think that's more like what the Dead Sea Scrolls were. That this, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit Essene characteristics, Zealot characteristics, and Messianic characteristics. And Sicari was a, a word is found in the Book of Acts 2. It's the Greek word for assassin or terrorist. And uh, Josephus, who's writing in Greek, likes to call the extreme nationalist partisan zealot groups, Sicarii, uh, assassins, but they certainly didn't call themselves this. So that's a pejorative, again, uh, being used, and so you have to say, who are the Sicarii? In Josephus, the Sicarii actually are the ones who commit suicide on Masada when the whole uh, revolution against Rome fails. And in the New Testament, you have this odd character, who we have recently found a gospel in his name, called Judas Iscariot. And uh, people, you just transpose the I and the S and you get Sicarius. And uh, that's the closest thing that we have there uh, to, his, uh, to his name. So it's pretty clear to a lot of us that that's a parody of uh, Judas the Zealot, Judas the Sicarii, uh, etc. And then, of course, he's portrayed in the most negative way, except in the New Gospel attributed to him, where there seems to be a somewhat reportrayal of him and so on. So um, I don't know when Christ, Christ or Christian came into play. It's very late. It's overseas. It's Greek. If it's a precise translation of something, I don't know. But in Palestine, these are the groups we have. The poor, the Ebionites, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Essenes, Zealots, the Zealot Essenes, the Sicarii Essenes, and so on and so forth. One last point I'd like to make on that particular uh, subject. Josephus says the Essenes participated in the war against Rome. Now, in his description of Essenes, you wouldn't get any idea because most people think of Essenes as retiring monastic sort of people. They weren't this, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were very active and not retiring, and they were uh, aggressive and not self-effacing, and so on. Uh, militant, I, I would say. So he said they didn't mind dying any kind of death. They withstood any kind of torture. In other words, they were the first martyrs, just like early Christianity says Christians were. They were the first martyrs, and uh, they, wouldn't, they would not take the name, call any man Lord, or eat any fo forbidden things. Hippolytus says the same thing, except 
he's speaking about the Zealot Essenes or the Sicarii Essenes. And he says the same thing that they would withstand any torture, go to their death, any kind of thing like that. But they would not eat things sacrificed to idols rather than for forbidden things. Well, if you look at early Christian literature and you look at the book of Acts again, Acts 15, where the so-called Jerusalem Council is taking place, the final rulings by James are abstain from things sacrificed to idols. Now, that is something James is portrayed as disseminating to the whole of early Christianity from his leadership in Jerusalem. Now you look at Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, he's heaping abuse on those people who abstain from things sacrificed to idols. He knows that eating and not eating or prohibiting eating things sacrificed to idols is a very important thing. And therefore he starts arguing all through 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 about this, uh, this uh, stricture from obviously from James whom he opposes. And he says, oh, an idol is nothing in the world. You know, these people's consciences are weak. So because they have such weak consciences, you know, you're eating such things in front of them might cause them to um, stumble, I'm paraphrasing here. So when you're around them, uh, don't do that because you don't want to cause your brother to stumble. Uh, but uh, as for me, later on in the same letter, he says, there are no forbidden things. Eat anything in the butcher shops. He also says some of these people in Romans, in the other letter, are so weak that they'll only eat vegetables. So <laughs> this is how he talks about this. And um, it shows that things sacrificed to idols and not eating them, which Josephus says, or rather Hippolytus, is, Josephus says is what they were really not going to eat is extremely important and kind of ties all these things together. Well, yes, the word Christ or Christians can uh, refer to the Palestine Messianic movement. Um, but it's a later term uh, that has been used overseas in northern Syria, Acts, the book of Acts that describes the, its version of the growth of the, what it calls the church, says Christians were first called Christians in Antioch in Syria. Now that is not a revolutionary uh, movement in Antioch in Syria. That's a Pauline church. They would be opposed basically to the Messianic movement in Palestine they would be transforming it into something quite different, a pacifist, pro-Roman sort of uh, uh, Messianic movement that we're now all familiar with. So it isn't the same as the Messianic movement in Palestine. It's a, it's a later uh, reformulation of the Messianic movement in Palestine. So yes, it can certainly originally uh, referred to that, but that's not what it, what it became because the Pauline community in Antioch is very different from whatever could have been considered the Dead Sea Scrolls, the James community in uh, Jerusalem, or anything like that. Excellent. So let's move on to why the Jews rebelled from Rome in 66 CE. Were there statues that were trying to be placed in the temples and they didn't believe in that? And well, there was a revolt of the Jews ultimately in 66 CE or AD, depending on how you like to describe these dates. And as um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, puts it in the one revealing portion at the end of his book called The Jewish War, he says the thing that most moved the Jews' revolt against Ro Rome was an obscure prophecy from among their writings that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. Well, uh, we recognize that as what the Christian religion uh, considers its Christ or Christianity founder to be. Um, Josephus himself says in his own cynical way that they were mistaken about this, that it actually applied to the destroyer of the Jewish people in Palestine and the destroyer of the Jewish temple, the future emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, who uh, everyone knows from the Arch of Titus in Rome, where is pictured all the prisoners and uh, booty from uh, the war of 66. Now, this war in 66 went on from 66 to 70 AD, and actually the final stages of it are also described in Josephus, 
in the Masada, which people have heard of, the Masada episode, which is a uh, um, sort of a uh, plateau or a um, one of those uh, uh, geographical features you see in Arizona and places a, a sort of um, mesa. mesa, yeah, a mesa. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, the, the, this Masada is a, is a really a sort of mesa of the kind you're familiar with in places like Arizona, uh, on which was built a palace, a step palace, but also it had uh, storage bins and things like that. And he pictures the zealots, but the most extreme wing of the zealots, one of the Jewish parties, he considers Josephus, that is, responsible for the war against Rome, the Sicarii. This is where the Sicarii retreat to. Sicarii is a Greek term. Uh, it's uh, named after the, uh, the knife, supposedly, that he says they carried under their vestments to assassinate their opponents. That's Josephus, who is already prejudiced because he's gone over to the Roman side. But that would be like the curved dagger Arabs even wear to this, to this day. Uh, they maybe have uh, used these uh, in various ways. But I'm sure they didn't call themselves Sicarii. Uh, that's a pejorative. But on this Masada, they're the ones who commit suicide with all their families and uh, children and everyone else rather than surrender to Rome. So that's the last stage of the war against Rome, 73 AD. So this war against Rome is 66 to 70. The temple is destroyed. There's a lot of discussion who did it, but Clearly the Romans did it, burned it in 70 AD, and then it continues out in the Dead Sea area at Masada. But I think there's some numerology here. That 66, if you look at it carefully, is three and a half years after the death of James in 62. And I feel that the death, of the, I, I, in my work I have um, uh, uh, described a, a sequentiality in these things, that uh, you have the Sicarii or extreme zealots um, assassinating collaborating priests. So for instance, the picture in the New Testament, the Gospels, of the high priests and so on condemning Jesus with the Roman authorities, etc., doesn't show you that the people, the general populace was against this establishment. It shows, it uses this as a way of blaming the Jews in some way for the death of their savior and so on. And it doesn't give you the picture of unrest and um, um, uh, disaffection that existed in the general population. So the sequentiality is the, 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 the assassination of one of these uh, priests, the son of the priest pictured in the gospels as taking part in the uh, trial of Jesus. Um, and name is An An Ananus his name, and this one was called Jonathan. Then he's assassinated. Then there is a, a retribution on the Sicarii, probably, I think, the stoning of James, which follows that. Then the fire in Rome, which follows that. And then Nero's using of the fire in Rome, supposedly in Christian history, to um, incriminate Christians, but which is actually incriminating these Messianic zealot type people who are probably using the fire in Rome to uh, uh, answer the death of people like their leader, righteous people like James, and then this attempt by Nero to um, um, exacerbate the situation in Palestine and to uh, um, force the Jews to revolt against Rome so he could suppress and destroy them. That's the sequentiality I see. So the three and a half years after the death of, of, uh, of James is the year 66 where the lower priesthood stops sacrifice on behalf of the Roman emperor in the temple, which is the signal for the uprising against Rome. And that's a popular uprising across the board, except for establishment collaborationist groups. Collaborationist groups meaning the Herodians, the Herod family put in power in Palestine by the Romans. The Sadducees meaning the Romanizing and Herodian high priests, not the Dead Sea Scrolls or Jesus uh, uh, type of high priests, James type of uh, high priests, and the Pharisees who are pictured as uh, ultimately their leader, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai in the Talmud, 
um, is pictured as also like Josephus proclaiming uh, Vespasian as a messiah that would come out of Palestine to rule the world. In, and in return for that, not like Josephus, he wasn't made a Flavian. He was given a rabbinic academy in what's called Javne to found rabbinic Judaism. So, but the, this 66 is a very important date. The fire in Rome, which is part of a sequentiality that I've already tried to elucidate in my work, um, we don't know who caused it. Uh, the Christian literature says Nero caused it. A lot of Roman literature does too. Nero claims the Christian caused it. Um, we don't know who the Christians were in Rome at that time. Are they Jewish zealots? Are they Pauline uh, um, um, Christians, as they've come to be called? If they're Pauline Christians, they're not involved in setting fires. But if they're Jewish apocalyptic zealots or extremist uh, Sicarii zealot Essenes, like the early church historian Hippolytus speaks about, they could have and would have perhaps done this. So in my mind, you want me to say definitely, or uh, you're asking me definitely, or one is, I have to say that again. Um, I'm being asked definitely whether this was caused by these extremist Jewish zealot type groups in Rome. You can't be sure who caused it. Um, it's not clear, but they could have done it, yes. It could have been a response, a sequential response first to the assassination of the collaborating high priest in the 50s, then the stoning of James in the early 60s, then the fire in Rome, then uh, following this, the uh, Jewish revolt in Palestine. Thank you. Um, so was Rome a fraternal city? Was it afraid of the messianic movement? Um, Rome was um, certainly afraid of this messianic movement, uh, not only in Palestine, but elsewhere in the Mediterranean world. Uh, we know that these uh, people went out into other parts of the, Messiani uh, of the Mediterranean world. We know there were areas in northern Syria, which is not necessarily totally under Roman control at this time. The Persians and the Romans are contesting that area. But also North Africa, we know that there's a church in Egypt we know that there's unrest in Egypt. We know uh, Cyrenaica, uh, Luke in the book of Acts in the New Testament supposedly comes from uh, Cyrenaica, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, which is present day Libya. We know that after the war against Rome, uh, the uh, extreme zealots called the Sicarii and Josephus uh, mo uh, uh, moved down to Egypt. We know the Romans follow them there. We know that they burned this other temple that existed in Egypt at that time. They saw the temple and these groups as uh, part of this unrest. We know there were other revolts in uh, Cyrenaica that followed that. Um, we know there were, there were revolts in 115 that were put down in Egypt and the Jewish community in Egypt was virtually wiped out. We know this from the papyrus trash heaps there. We know finally that there was the second Jewish revolt in 132 to 136 under Hadrian's period, in Hadrian's period, which was more horrific than perhaps the one in 66 to 70, but there was no Josephus to catalog it in the way we have it cataloged in the earlier time in Josephus, so we don't know as much about it, but it was uh, as devastating or more. So were the Romans afraid of this movement? Yes, the Romans were terribly afraid of this movement, were terribly afraid of this movement. Uh, did they, uh, would they rather have it uh, defanged, pacified, turned into something that was not as threatening? Yes, certainly they would have preferred such a, th such a thing. Was there a Roman secret service? Was there a Roman intelligence organization? Were there people in Rome who understood how these things were operating? I don't know, but there were very knowledgeable people in Rome. There were Herodian family members who were connected to the Roman establishment, both in Palestine and in Rome. Um, there were the very famous uh, philosopher Seneca. That was Nero's uh, tutor. We have an, ap an apocryphal correspondence between Paul and Seneca. We have Paul meeting Seneca's brother in the Book of Acts in Corinth, in um, Greece, 
a governor called Gallio. We know that Nero, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, was it Nero? Yes, forced Seneca to commit suicide at one point, and so on. We have people who are very knowledgeable, and so I don't know. It just seems to me that when Paul and Josephus ultimately go to Rome, they don't get free in any way unless they are turned, unless they become uh, Roman instruments in some way. Josephus certainly becomes a Roman instrument after he goes to Rome in the 50s. He describes that he went to Rome to, on, an, on an appeal to Caesar. Uh, Paul also has an appeal to Caesar in the book of Acts. Something odd happens in Rome. We don't know what. He isn't seen maltreated according to Acts. And Acts uh, um, leaves off before it tells us what happens to him. Uh, in some versions of things, uh, there are characters very much like Paul that returned to Palestine at some point in the early 60s uh, uh, and uh, are sort of intermediaries. A, a character in Josephus called Salus, who I make a lot of in my work, Saul, Salus, Paul, and so on, who's an Herodian family member. I make a lot of him in my James, the brother of Jesus, in my New Testament code book, so uh, people can read about that if they want. But yes, I think the, there were people that were uh, ready to work for Rome uh, in these early movements, and uh, the pacification of the Messianic movement was very important to uh, Rome. Last point on that. In Romans 13, Paul says, the ruling authorities were placed here by God's will. Therefore, it's God's will that they are here. You should obey God's will. You should obey the ruling authorities. Well, you couldn't get a more, of course, it's a letter to the Romans. You couldn't get a more pro-Roman statement than that. And he goes on to say, and actually, you should pay your taxes to these authorities. Now, the tax question was the, was the burning question in, in Palestine over which these revolutionary movements uh, began 50, 60, 70 years before. He says, yes, you should pay your taxes, and the wearing of the sword will bring its own reward. And he bases this in the next uh, phrases in Romans 13 on one of the favorite passages of these Dead Sea Scroll type, uh, Jesus type, Messianic leader type uh, statements. That is, because you should love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> you couldn't have a more cynical interpretation of the famous love your neighbor as yourself, what's called the righteousness commandment, as that includes paying your tax to Rome because you should, because they are your neighbors and you should love them as, as yourself. You couldn't get more cynical. But you see, I'm not a great supporter of Paul. He, yeah, he says some things that are really um, quite uh, worrisome if you look at them carefully and not just as an awestruck uh, person of faith. A lot of people are, are not really familiar with the Herodian family. They see King Herod as great. We are calling him Herod the, the Great. They see uh, King Herod as a Jewish king. Uh, this is preposterous. This shows how little historical information is actually being conveyed in the Gospels. Of course, we're not really dealing much with King Herod, except that all the members of the uh, Herod family became called Herod, like all the members of the Caesar family, it became called Caesar in time. So it's very confusing to readers of the Gospels and the Book of Acts who the Herod is that they're talking about. But the first Herod, the King Herod, the one who died around 4th century or the turn of 4, 4, 4 BC or the turn of the eras, uh, uh, he, he was an Idumean Arab. And it's quite clear from the genealogies and so on that his father was a priest of Apollo, or his grandfather, from the city of uh, Ashkelon, Gaza area. Today, that's still called those names. And uh, that he had been either taken prisoner or taken over to Petra, which is in the Arab Transjordan area as it is now. And his mother was from Petra, was Arab background. So this, uh, this is not a born Jewish family in any way, shape, or form. It, I don't, I'm not hurting the Arabs. It's an Arab family. And uh, how are they king of the, of, the, of the Jews? How do they become Ju Judean kings? 
Because when the Romans conquered Palestine, they were looking for people who were aiding them and abetting them. And it turned out that Herod's father was one of the intermediaries who, uh, part, who, um, who um, participated in the Roman conquest of Palestine under Caesar's uh, 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 opponent, uh, Pompey, uh, in uh, 63 BC, when the temple was first stormed by uh, Romans. So Herod's father was in that uh, process of bringing Roman troops into Palestine, and as such, he became the first governor of Palestine. And Josephus describes that these people became Roman citizens in perpetuity, his whole family. So all Herodians were Roman citizens. There later on, uh, the three or four generations later, you get Paul or Silas, he's got a Roman citizenship. How has he got a Roman citizenship? In my work, one of the, that doesn't prove it, but one of the aspects of his being from this family is that he, 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 this is the reason he has a Roman citizenship. I'm sure Jesus didn't pull out a Roman citizenship. I'm sure James didn't pull out a Roman citizenship. I'm sure none of these people had Roman citizenships, only someone like Paul. He came from a very upper class family, probably of Herodian background. So who were the Herodians? They were a uh, Greco-Arab family, somewhat possibly Judaized, though only Judaized when it was convenient to please the subjects they were given who were put in power in Palestine and destroyed the previous Jewish ruling family, the Maccabean family, root and stalk, even though they used some of them to climb to power. So they, uh, we, Josephus de describes how Herod destroyed uh, he, uh, um, his uh, uh, grandfather-in-law, who he had married a Maccabean princess, Herod did. Uh, he he uh, destroyed her father. He had her executed. He had his own children by her executed. Uh, he had her brother executed. He killed everyone in the family and destroyed the Jewish Maccabean family, who were the Jewish heroes of the resistance that the Hanukkah family, uh, that the Hanukkah celebration is presently uh, um, uh, celebrated after. So who were the Herodians in Palestine? They were a Roman puppet rulership in Palestine, and the Romans used them elsewhere. They were perfect Roman civil servants. They used them in Asia Minor. They used them in Northern Syria. They put them in kingships in Armenia. They put them in lots of different places. They were, they were, they were what the Romans would call kings of the peoples. That is, in the east, uh, the peoples were not part of the Roman Empire. They were little separate kingdoms. And often families like the Herodians were put in power, but these were people with total Roman allegiances. Actually, I had a professor uh, when I was young at college who used to say uh, poetry was uh, truer than, uh, than history. And uh, I think basically he was right about that. It isn't uh, what actually happened that really matters. It's what people th uh, believe happened. And uh, the beliefs are in the old myths or in the old Greek legends or in the old Greek stories. Uh, somewhat he was applying it to that, but it's also in things like the Christian and somewhat even in the Jewish Bible. It's, it's uh, what the myth, what the poetry says that matters, uh, not what actually, actually happened. So each new generation, whatever you say, is going to hear the myth. And uh, that's what is, that's what is uh, true for them. And uh, what follows is uh, uh, the actual history is much too complex for the average person to ever get their head around. The question of Jesus' existence is a very difficult one. I mean, people have been arguing about it since Albert Schweitzer's time and before. It's known as the quest for the historical um, Jesus. Uh, the point is, something what I was just talking about, poetry being truer than history. Uh, the poetry is very powerful. Uh, people people have, have, have love elements of the story that they're presented with. It's something that they believe in, they care about, and they uh, actually um, live their lives uh, by it. Um, the poetry for Christianity is in the Gospels, the four Gospels. In fact, if there's a competitive Gospel, like the Gospel of Judas that recently uh, uh, surfaced, that's rejected all, outright by the uh, down-the-line 
believers. So it's in the it's in the Gospels. The poetry is there. So I don't think that Jesus can be historically um, uh, defended. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that we can uh, that we can um, extend to that particular Jesus. I say to my uh, students and other associates and friends, the, actually the best evidence for the existence of Jesus is the fact that his, he had a brother called James. Now, we can document pretty, pretty good a lot of things about James because the, uh, the material about James hasn't been mythologized to the same extent. It hasn't been overwritten with um, other people's ideas to the same extent. You know, in Islamic tradition, we have the Quran and so on, and then you have what's called the Hadith literature. That would be the poetry. Hadith is like news about the prophet. Hadith means news, like gospel literature. A vast literature of almost a huge amount of sayings being put into the prophet's mouth, some of which people say is authentic, a lot of which is inauthentic, people think, Western people. Muslims, of course, are like Orthodox Christians. They take it all as authentic. So um, the Gospels are, are like that, are like a, a Hadith literature. Um, the question is, how much of that can you rely on? Well, let me give two, two, two passages that I think, you know, show some of the character of this. Uh, some of the, what we call the synoptic Gospels, the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that more or less resemble each other, John being somewhat different in some aspects and historical um, uh, um, development line. Um, you have this uh, passage uh, where Jesus, uh, I say is pictured, because I think that's all it is, a picture, um, spits in people's eyes in order to cure them of blindness or on their tongues or in their ears or however it is to, uh, to cure them of being deaf and dumb or something like that. Now, look, at those are the characteristics of Hellenistic, you know, uh, um, sort of literature, uh, healer kind of, uh, uh, I think, mythological characters. I don't think any of us in the modern 21st century want our Messiah to be spitting on people's tongues in order to stop them from being uh, uh, tongue-tied or something or spitting in their ears to stop them from being deaf and dumb. Those are the characteristics of Hellenistic literature. Uh, for instance, Jesus at one point in the same sequence, which is developing an attack on, on I think, Dead Sea Scrolls people. I could explain why, but I don't have time. But uh, that same pa set of passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, develops into something where Jesus said, is presented in Mark as saying, he said these things declaring all foods clean. Now, declaring all foods clean is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians when he starts on the thing sacrificed to idols and finally ends up uh, with, for me, there is nothing unlawful, all things are lawful, eat all the food in the butcher shops. Uh, this is in the same passage where he's talking about um, not eating things sacrificed to idols. So uh, these passages end up with Jesus saying, um, he said these things, declaring all foods clean. But in the process, he says, or is pictured as saying, in these arguments with the so-called Pharisees and so on, um, you should actually not have to wash your hands before eating. He says this. He says this. Now, I don't think the historical Jesus ever said any such thing. Why is he saying this? Because it's an attack on... Jewish Palestinian law of the Pauline type. So that is basically a Pauline position being retrospectively put into the mouth of the um, historical Jesus. For instance, how does he say this? He says, well, um, there are commandments of God and there are the traditions of men. Uh, he, the, he, that's from Talmudic material, uh, of the, the, uh, tr the traditions of uh, men. And he says, uh, uh, one of the traditions of men is uh, you should uh, wash your hands uh, uh, before eating. Uh, but you see, uh, a tradition from God is love your, uh, is honor your parents. Honor your parents. That's part of the Ten, ten, commands, uh, ten Commandments. Well, 
your parents didn't uh, wash their hands before eating, going out to the Gentile world to preach Christianity as we know it. Therefore, you shouldn't have to either because that's a commandment from God and the commandment to wash your hands is only a commandment of, of, of men. Well, to my mind, this is a totally specious, uh, what we would call in um, platonic philosophy, uh, an ad hominem argument. Uh, um, the groups that uh, Plato is, is attacking, the, the sophists, the sophistry would argue in, the, in, in this manner. And I don't think any of us now would say, oh, you shouldn't wash your hands before eating. So, you know, those are things I wouldn't attribute to the historical Jesus. So what about the sayings in the, in the, in the Gospels? Can we rely on them? I'm not sure. I don't think we can. I think a lot of them have been affected by retrospective uh, party strife, Pauline theology. And um, I think that as far as the, uh, the, the, the presentation of the Jesus character, it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time. Many messianic leaders of the time, most or all of whom came to a bad end, usually by crucifixion because crucifixion was the Roman punishment for seditious activity. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the Jews forbade crucifixion. It was in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's specifically condemned. It's specifically condemned as something that is an affront to God, that you, that, that, that you cannot crucify people because you should not hang a man up alive. Uh, and uh, that's in the, the uh, a document called the Nahum Commentary in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's a specific answer to those things uh, in the Gospels, uh, implying that the Jews either approved of crucifixion or were involved in uh, crucifixion. Crucifixion was a Roman punishment, the first evidence of which you see in the Spartacus uprising in the 80s BC period when after Spartacus the gladiator led his uh, gladiatorial followers in these uh, terrible uh, battles against Rome, when the Romans finally triumphed, they crucified people from all the way from Rome to Naples. And this is pictured by the Roman historians as a horrible, they left the bodies up there just to stink and rot for, you know, un until they, uh, they decayed. What is it? It's a message to the people. This is what's going to happen to you if you raise your hand against the might of uh, Rome. So, yes, it's a, it's, it's a, Roman, it's a Roman punishment, and uh, it's one of the instances there where uh, the Gospels really uh, can't be relied on in terms of uh, any Jewish participation in this. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, get the Jews out of this, but the point is, is this the historical Jesus? Yes, there are innumerable messianic contenders, leaders, others crucified. I would say up to the war against Rome, they're probably, and including the war against Rome, Josephus describes how he helps takes a few people down who were friends of his that the Romans were crucifying after they took Jerusalem. I would say there were literally hundreds of thousands of people crucified in Palestine from around zero to about 70 AD and, and um, beyond. The only one we've ever heard of is this Jesus story. There are hundreds of thousands of revolutionary opponents and seditious people crucified in Roman Palestine, maybe 100,000 or so over that, over that time span. And um, so the Jesus character, I think, yes, is a composite of many of these characters, but how much is historical? It's impossible to say, but there's very little contemporary testimony about this particular individual in this manner. So what does the name Jesus mean? Well, you see, the name Jesus is a um, gr Greekified um, transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua, which in Hebrew is Yehoshua, which gets short shortened in conversations to Yeshua, and then over into Greek becomes Jesus in Greek transliteration. Joshua literally does, and uh, he's presented as a kind of being, a, does mean savior, he who saves. 
In the Joshua case, he who saves his people. In the Jesus case, he who saves the world. But it has a theological impact. Now, was there an actual Jesus person in Palestine? Well, there are lots of people with that name, but was there one crucified in this manner? Well, you will look in vain in Josephus, the contemporary historian, for such a presentation. There's one presentation that everyone considers to be a um, retrospective uh, invention in um, Josephus. But uh, was there uh, such a person crucified? We don't know. Now, was Jesus called Jesus? Well, if you know your Gospels well, you will see the fact that he, uh, that he has four brothers. And uh, the four brothers come with uh, Mary, the mother, and they're called James, Simon, Jude, and Joses. If you actually look at the Greek, Joses in the Greek, J-S-S, -S, and Jesus, J-S-S, -S, really is basically the same Greek name. So uh, we know a lot about James. We get to know over the course of time in the native Hebrew literature, for, I'm not talking about the Gospels now, a lot about Simon. Uh, I think we know a lot about Jude, not only Jude, the brother of James in the New Testament, but Judas Iscariot as presented in the New Testament and others by that name. But Joses, we don't know anything about any Joses. I think that Joses is actually Jesus, but it could be Joshua, Joses, Josiah, I don't know what it's based on. But the point is, as the Jesus picture develops over the first century and maybe into the second, people haven't agreed how old the Gospels actually are, that what happens is that fathers become uncles, um, brothers become cousins, and I think uh, people like Jesus himself, or I don't know how to put it, turns into his own brother or vice versa, his own brother turns into him. In other words, this is a way of distancing physical uh, members of the messianic family, if you want to call it that, or messianic families like this, um, f away from the supernatural Christ. The supernatural Christ is the basis of what Christianity becomes in overseas communities like the Pauline community in uh, Antioch in northern Syria, where Christians were first called Christians according to Acts. The supernatural Christ is the basis, basically, of Paul's writings. Now, I don't think Jews ever believed in the supernatural Messiah as such. Uh, there are some indications of some supernatural aspects to the Messiah in the War Scroll. He says, uh, because the War Scroll, when talking about the star prophecy, speaks about a prophecy about, uh, and Assyria will fall by the hand of no mere man. And it goes on to talk about this no mere man. So there are some, some hints at that. But normally speaking, the Jews didn't, didn't, weren't talking about a supernatural being and, and certainly not a godlike uh, God being. So as the supernatural Christ idea in the Greco-Hellenistic Roman world uh, develops, the members of the family get pushed further and further away. And I think actually Jesus turns into his own brother. So uh, I don't know what the physical Jesus was, and um, I don't know, uh, I can't give you any information about uh, his historical existence. But I have said that uh, who and whatever James was, Jesus' uh, alleged closest r relative and successor, even in the Gospels and the New Testament and the book of Acts and the letters, uh, so was Jesus. So I have in my work tried to do this, look for the historical James in order to find the historical Jesus. In other words, like in American history, do you think that uh, Robert Kennedy uh, was very different in his ideas from John Kennedy or Edward Kennedy, very different and so on? A little bit, but probably not totally opposite. They upheld the family tradition, whatever the first ones were. So the second and third tried to uh, follow that. The same with this family. So if you can find the historical James, you can find the historical Jesus. But if you try to find him through the historical Paul, who admits to being the enemy of early Christianity in Palestine, 
to have persecuted early Christianity in Palestine, even to have put some to death, and is pictured in Acts as leading riots against early Christians, so-called Christians, in uh, Palestine. If you try to find them in that literature, through the enemy, if you like, of early Christianity in Palestine's point of view, I think you can't find him. What you're finding in his literature, as he himself says, is someone he calls Christ Jesus. In his letters, he's the first one to use that term, Christ Jesus. And for him, Christ Jesus is a supernatural being. Christ Jesus is in heaven and giving him personal, um, Christ Jesus is in heaven and giving him personal revelations. And he considers himself to have a personal contact with this supernatural Christ in heaven who has appointed him an apostle, as he calls it, an apostle to the Gentiles. The beginning of Galatians. I, Paul, an apostle, not by men, i.e. not by the Jerusalem church, not by James, not carrying letters of appointment by James, but by Christ Jesus himself, that is direct appointment by the supernatural Christ who he never saw, never encountered, and never met in his lifetime. So to my mind, uh, a person of that kind is basically reflecting his own ideology when he speaks about the supernatural visions. And if you're looking for the historical Christ, you've got to look to these other people. So going back to the original point, who and whatever James was, so was Jesus. The Jews would have reacted to the portrayal of Jesus Christ in the gospel very, very, very negatively uh, as he's portrayed in the gospel because uh, he's uh, basically Paulinized um, talking about things like um, don't wash your hands before eating, uh, things of that kind, or paying the tax to Rome, very, very unpopular. Uh, so we know the whole war against Rome was based on not paying the taxes to Rome and so on. So uh, surely that, that person would have been a very unpopular uh, person who spoke those things, but he wouldn't have been greeted in the messianic ways portrayed in the Gospels as popular among the masses if he had doctrines of that kind. Which is why I say, if you want to find the doctrines of the historical Jesus in Palestine, go to the historical James, who was very popular. We know this from early church literature. We know this from other documents, like uh, one called the Pseudo-Clementine Recognitions, that pictures the popularity of James in his time in, uh, in Palestine. That is a kind of opposition acts, uh, very different from acts. By the way, we have a Peter in the Pseudo-Clementine. Uh, they're called Pseudo-Clementines because the church has said they're pseudo-false writings under the name of, of uh, Clement, but they're no more false than any, any other document. It's just that, doctrinally speaking, they're not acceptable. Anyway, we have a Peter in the Pseudo-Clementine Recognitions who is a gentle Peter, an Essene-type Peter, a Peter who wears threadbare clothes, a Peter who bathes every morning at dawn, just like the Essenes are portrayed as doing in Josephus and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and a Peter who never utters anti-Semitic statements, as the Peter in uh, Acts is continually pictured as doing, and uh, a, um, a Peter who is a total follower of James, who is totally not only subordinate to James, but honors all of James's instructions. Mm -hmm. okay, now we these were people, these people, by the way, these people like Peter, or as pictured in the pseudo-Clementine recognitions, not in the book of Acts, or um, someone like James are, were very popular in Palestine. And I believe the Essene Zealot movements were very popular in Palestine. That was a good point. Uh, now we get to a personal question. Can you describe your personal struggle in getting important information about the Dead Sea Scrolls to the public? Well, the struggle over the freeing of the Dead Sea Scroll was um, over the freeing. The struggle over the freeing of the Dead Sea Scrolls was. Um, very difficult only because of the uh, entrenched positions that people had in different areas of the debate. I personally um, hadn't known that the scrolls were not all revealed until very late in my teaching career at California State University in Long Beach. Uh, it wasn't clear to me. It was only after uh, uh, speaking to several scholars of different kinds that I discovered that 
most of the materials of the scrolls hadn't yet been published or were even available to the public. So when I was a National Endowment for the uh, Endowments Fellow at the Albright Inst Institute of Archaeology in Israel, Palestine, it was on the Jordanian uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem side, so it might have been called Palestine at that time. Um, when I was a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, researcher, associate there, uh, I had come to work on the community of James and the Dead Sea Scrolls community. And there was literally, literally nothing I could do there because of the uh, fact that the uh, scrolls were unpublished. So that's when I began this campaign to try to open up all the scrolls so everyone could work on them and not just see them through the uh, tendentious view of one set of scholars who had control of them, mostly under the authority of uh, certain uh, church members in Palestine, but some academic people at Harvard and other places like that. Well, uh, some people may uh, consider what I was doing heroic. It was only heroic because of the defamation that occurred in the process of trying to, to do this. I mean, we were not doing anything wrong. We were just trying to open up these materials to public uh, scrutiny and for, so every scholar could approach them individually and not be under anyone's authority. And also we wanted in the old uh, Chinese phraseology, let a thousand voices sing. Uh, but the uh, reaction and the, uh, I consider, in fact, uh, vitriolic defamation was uh, so strong in some areas that it looked like we were being heroic in some manner. We certainly didn't feel heroic at the time, but in retrospect, some of the vindictiveness uh, makes one feel that it was a, a, a somewhat um, um, courageous struggle. The scrolls, as um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, produced this uh, vitriol among certain air, uh, quarters of uh, the academic uh, community because people had their whole scholarly reputations tied up in their interpretations, and still do. The the um, what we call scholarly cabals or uh, scholarly consensuses have have uh, reformed. We've hardly dented them, frankly. Uh, people are still being taught the abs a a a absolute same things about the scrolls as they were before they were all out because everything has reformed because that's the way uh, scholarly um, uh, sort of um, um, consensus or academic um, uh, yay saying fellowships work. It's sort of like a curia. Uh, you know, a certain doctrine takes hold, and if you don't ascribe to that doctrine, you don't get into the certain graduate programs, you don't get the uh, doctor fathers, as they're called, the professors, to entertain your theses. Your theses are poorly reviewed in journals, and so on and so forth. It extends very, very wide. In the scrolls, it had additional ramifications, like uh, in this book here, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, which we uh, printed some of the first doc, uh, doc documents from the unpublished materials that we uh, saw after I got my, uh, uh, after all the pictures came into my possession, we were able uh, to look the, uh, to 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 look them over. Uh, I concluded in the preface to this book that control of the unpublished materials meant control of the field, and they could by giving a certain document out to a given student make instant scholarly superstars out of this particular student because this particular student uh, would be given a document that scholars who were, had been in the field for 30, 40 years weren't even shown, and then they could publish them and so on, and they had the instant reputation of uh, being the uh, editors and interpreters of this document. And these interpretations then became almost uh, um, like uh, uh, orthodoxy. So, um, so yes, uh, uh, it was a very uh, uh, harsh environment, and uh, I think ultimately uh, to open them up was to break the monopoly. But that doesn't mean that by breaking the monopoly, what we saw, you see, in the, in the materials was 
a material that uh, resembled early Christianity. So uh, to break the monopoly would be to break open the debate concerning these materials further. But just because you open them all up doesn't mean you win the, the debate in the end. The debate in the end in the academic world is dominated uh, by the academic uh, uh, um, um, let me see how I would put that. The debate in the end in the academic world is uh, dominated by these uh, academic uh, professorial uh, consensus. And um, you're not necessarily going to penetrate those things in the near term because those people have their academic reputations totally tied up in them. It isn't like physics that an Einstein can go out and say, okay, let's see if light bends around the moon or uh, one of the planets, or Mercury, or, or something lo lo like that. These people have their academic reputations uh, built up on their theories, and in their lifetimes, they're never going to say, I was wrong. I have never met a scholar yet who said, who's saying my early theories were wrong. Uh, that's never going to happen. Now, some of their students might be influenced in the uh, generations that follow by the new pe uh, people, uh, by, the, by the new materials but never any of the presently active academicians who have been active during the time of the opening up of the scrolls. There is a theory, or some, some people think that people were hiding things. I never ascribe to the idea that things were being purposefully hidden. I think they were being um, seen through this myopia of people's backgrounds and training and um, they wanted control of the document, shall we say, not only for their own academic prestige, but to pass it on to their students and so on and so forth. It became a self-perpetuating monopoly. I don't give the people who held the documents at that time credit for seeing uh, huge things in the unpublished materials that would be worrisome to them, doctrinally speaking. The whole corpus was worrisome, doctrinally speaking, including all the published materials that was already out there. It's just that by controlling the publishing uh, pace and network and the way it went forward, they controlled the interpretation. By controlling official documents, they controlled the interpretation. So I don't believe in this uh, conspiracy uh, that there was an attempt to right, suppress information as such. The information was already all out there, the star prophecy and so on and so forth. The point was is that, yes, they may have had a feeling that there were crazies coming in. I heard one person put it, um, let's go slow. Someone who worked on the early documents reported this to me when I was a National Endowment for the Humanities fellow in Jerusalem. His fellow since passed away. He was very involved in the... Uh, people who were editing the scrolls because he was a German scholar who could actually do the work, the priests and others who were involved in it, a lot of them couldn't even do the work that well, but he could. Uh, and uh, he told me, they, they said, let's go slow till the crazies go away. And they meant by crazies, people who were trying to identify this with early Christianity in some way. So, so yes, control, uh, there were uh, people who, who were under authority who couldn't go beyond a certain point. And therefore, their uh, mindset was to, they couldn't see Jesus in these materials. Father Millick, uh, one of the editors with Father DeVoe uh, of the materials who were part of the um, international team that the Jordanians put in place after the um, division and partition of Palestine and the takeover of Jerusalem and the museum, the Rockefeller Museum by the Jordanians in the early 50s, uh, Father, uh, Father Millick said, uh, uh, yes, these documents would look Christian, but there's uh, nothing in them uh, uh, resembling uh, the supernatural Christ. Well, well, he's basically saying what we're saying, yes, and of course, there's nothing in them uh, resembling the supernatural Christ that we're familiar with because these are not so-called Christian documents that we're familiar with overseas and in the modern uh, Western world. These are Palestinian messianic documents that preceded this that were what was uh, the authentic messianic movement before it went overseas, was Hellenized and became Polonized. So, of course, 
th there wouldn't be anything like this. So for him, this meant the documents had to be way, way, way pre-Christian. Pre so they pushed them as far back into the first century and second century BC as their mind could encompass. And uh, uh, this was all that I saw what was really happening. So people with an opposition viewpoint, they froze out of the process. They didn't show any documents to. They didn't allow into the official editing process. They weren't part of the official teams. John Allegro was part of the official team because he had some disturbing ideas. He was actually uh, not only frozen out, but ultimately uh, cast out of the editorial teams. Uh, unfortunately, John Allegro uh, sort of self-destructed thereafter and played right into their hands because it was at the time of the hippie movement and he got into the whole idea of a hippie sort of uh, uh, um, drug-related culture and so on and wrote some silly books thereafter. But um, the point was that people were thrown out and ultimately it was a consensus dominated by um, pretty much uh, all the, Orthodox Christian uh, theology. There were certain. It was certainly Judenrein. There, 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 there were no Jews in the editorial process. Only after the uh, conquest of East Jerusalem in '67 did the I I Israelis get into it. But the Israelis weren't really familiar with these arguments. They didn't know much about early Christianity. They accepted the academic. Uh, uh, um, network and consensus, if you want to call it that, as um, uh, must have been true. They, they, they didn't have a, a deep understanding of the roots of early Christianity or how it could resemble this. And plus, from the 60s to the 80s, when we started this campaign to free the scrolls, uh, the Israelis were more worried about getting uh, um, good Roman support, Roman Christian, uh, Catholic uh, support in Rome from uh, the Vatican and other places for the, what they were trying to accomplish in, in Jerusalem. The scrolls were very low on their, on their registry at that time or their, or their totem pole, if you want to call it that. Huh. But since we started their campaign and, the, and we were behind the campaign to free the scrolls, the scrolls became world famous. Oh no, suddenly the Israelis all bought into it. And now you get the Israeli exhibitions all over the world of the scrolls and so on and so forth. And you get Israeli editorial teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who, were all, who all bought into it. But that, that was after the fact. They never helped. In fact, they also opposed it uh, because they were part of, they followed the consensus. And the people who got into the Israeli editing processes were people who followed the original consensus. So to this day, no opposition, no opposition people get into the official editing processes. So uh, the, the important thing about throwing the scrolls open is to, again, like I said, let a thousand voices sing. And that was the point of Professor Robinson and Claremont, who was instrumental in helping get the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels and materials out, uh, that we said in our, um, our, our preface, we wanted it to be open to all scholars, so no one had a, um, um, an advantage over any other scholar. For instance, they used to have academic uh, conferences where you could bring a new document to the conference and say, uh, that no one had ever seen before, and then you can claim, oh, well, you never saw this document, and here we have it. One of the most famous documents of this kind was MMT, uh, Mixat Masay Torah, and this document there were actually lawsuits uh, ultimately in Israel concerning. I was involved in them, unfortunately. I was dragged into them, even though we didn't need that particular document to do any work with, because we had all the pictures anyway. Why did we need someone else's transcription of this document? <coughs> but because the publisher of this facsimile edition that we had done put it into his publisher's forward, we were dragged into put a picture of a publication of this doc document that was done in Poland uh, we were dragged into it because we were, Robinson and I, considered the editors of this uh, pic uh, collection of photographs. We purposely called ourselves, um, we, uh, we abjured the, uh, the, the, the term editor. We said the facsimile edition of all the photographs, 1780 or so of the unpublished scrolls, we called it uh, prepared with a preface by Eisenman and Robinson. And uh, the uh, translation in Hebrew went editor. So we got dragged into the process 
uh, but we didn't need MMT, but th that's the kind of thing that, uh, that occurred, lawsuits, all sorts of trouble. So yeah, it became a, a very, uh, very um, fractious and uh, spiritually wounding process. I have a whole chapter in my James the Brother of Jesus book, which is this book here, on uh, the circles in Rome that would have had an interest in the creation of the materials that uh, ultimately would have ended up in the uh, different gospel presentations. Materials that, uh, like a snowball going downhill, gathered additional materials as they went down into different presentations. Recently, we've had the Gospel of Judas appear. The point is, we have all the Gnostic materials. The point is, this was a very uh, active, uh, developing, uh, extremely widely uh, practiced literature. And it had nothing really much to do with uh, what had actually happened in Palestine. No, I don't know. Um, we're talking about a Simon in the Messianic movement who has the same characteristics as the Simon in the Gospels. Uh, um, I don't know what we're talking about there. The point of the matter is that the Simon in the Gospels is often confused as well. There are two Simons in the Gospels. When you look at the Apostle lists, you have uh, one, the famous so-called Simon Peter, but further along, you have someone called Simon the Cananean. Uh, and uh, we wouldn't know what Simon the Cananean meant, except uh, these are in the Synoptic Gospels. In the Gospel of John, they don't even enumerate these people exactly like that. Uh, there is hardly a parallel in the uh, John Gospel. But in the Synoptics, uh, Matthew, Mark speak of Simon the Cananean or Canaanite, as a lot of people like to say. Well, that's total nonsense. Luke has it finally right. He, he, he mentioned Simon the Zealot. And uh, so um, the, the point is that in Hebrew, Cana is zeal. So a person who was part of the Zealot movement would be a, a, a Cananiam or a Cananean. And therefore, Luke has properly translated it into, uh, into uh, um, uh, Greek. So there is a Simon that actually is a Simon the Zealot as a partisan of uh, Jesus. So I don't know about Simon Peter and all this other sort of thing. But one of the, one of the important things is there is a person in early church literature who is considered um, clearly a, um, a relative of James called Simon Barcleophus. And he is the second successor to Jesus in the movement in Palestine. And uh, as you know, a Peter is often called Cephas. So you have that problem of Cephas, Cleophas, all these sorts of things. So to my mind, uh, the character of Simon Peter, as he's presented in the Gospels, as a leader of the early church and so on, is more like Simon Barcleophas. Now, is Simon Barcleophas the same as Simon the Zealot? Here's another uh, conundrum. In the way the, God, the apostles are enumerated, you have three in a row. You have James Alphaeus. You have then, uh, uh, I think it is um, Simon the Zealot, and then Jude, I forget how he's put his brother or so on, something of, of that, uh, to, to, to that effect. Well, those three names, Jude, Simon, and, uh, and uh, James are the names of three of Jesus' brothers. So Alphaeus, the Kappa and the Alpha resembling each other obviously in script, is easily confused with Cleophas and so on. So this is all very obscure, but the point of the matter is those three characters look very much like Jesus and his brothers. So let's go over to Simon the Zealot, or, or I mean, was Simon Barcleophus um, part of the Zealot movement? I don't know, but Simon the Zealot obviously was. Were there Zealots in early Christianity? Yes. Acts 21 says, uh, when Paul makes his last trip, and that is a part of Acts that most scholars consider to be fairly authentic, 
because it's what we call the we document. Says, uh, uh, we call it the we document because in, uh, between Acts 15 and 16, the narrative goes from he, they to I, we. Uh, the narrative switches and people consider that an actual travel document. The supernatural sorts of materials we get in Acts uh, disappear and we get a more mundane, down-down earth, pretty uh, straightforward travel document. And in that document, uh, Paul goes for his last visit up to uh, Jerusalem to meet James, and James is not introduced. It's assumed we know who he is, but he never had been in introduced in Acts previously. And the other James that most people think it is has already been executed in Acts previously. So we have no idea who this James is, but he's the leader of the early church. And he goes in to see James, so it's clearly James, the brother of, of um, Jesus. And James then says to Paul, uh, it says that, oh, everyone uh, was greeted Paul enthusiastically and so on. And then James uh, seems to speak and says, but you see, Paul, we are all here zealots for the law. And we hear that you have been teaching overseas against the people, uh, against the temple, and against the law. So to show that you've not been doing this, we want you to go into the temple and do this obscure Nazarite oath process in which people went in and did some temple obligations and shaved their heads afterwards and pay for four others we have under similar vow. So there is an indication that again we have zealots in the early movement. Finally, in Galatians, where Paul is arguing against the Jerusalem leadership, he says, on a whole section of Galatians 4, some are zealous, but not always zealous for a good thing. And many are zealous after you to make them be like themselves. In other words, he's parroting the word zeal, 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 uh, over and over and over again. So, yeah, we have a lot of indications that they are zealots. But is Simon the Peter a zealot? I have no idea. But is Simon Peter an Essene? According to the pseudo-Clementine recognitions, yes. Is he a Jamesian? According to the pseudo-Clementine recognitions, yes. According to Galatians, is Simon sometimes called Cephas, sometimes called Peter, where it's hard to tell who is who in, in Galatians. Paul changes his terminology there. Is he a Jamesian? Yes, because when the messengers from James come down to Antioch, uh, Peter or Cephas stops keeping table fellowship with Gentiles because this is the instructions he receives from James. So I don't know about zealots, but these people are part of the James movement. I do think Christians resemble uh, movements in Palestine very, very much. I do think that, in fact, it's possible, and this is a purely um, speculative, um, this is purely, this is purely a speculative uh, possibility that uh, Christians are a transposition of the word Sikari. And if you look at the spelling and so on of the two words, just like Iscariot, I got this idea from Iscariot and Sikari. That Judas Iscariot is kind of like and one of the key early Christian leaders. And by the way, he does parallel another brother of Jesus, that is the Jude of James, the Judas of James, Ju Judas the brother of James, and so on. This uh, Judas Iscariot, who is considered to be the son or brother of Simon Iscariot, again, another parallel, looks like Sicari. Now, Christian itself, if you transpose the, uh, the K-H sound and the R and the S and just turn them around the slightest bit, you're really dealing with words of the same syllabification, Sicari, Christian, the only difference is we put a T in there. But other than that, you're basically in the same world as Iscariot and Sicari. So the Christian, the word Christian may have been a parody of the word Sicari once it went over overseas. Maybe it was part of this transformation. I do think there is an, an intricate relationship between the Sicari movement and the early uh, Christian movement, if you call it that, in quotes in Palestine, before it went overseas to Antioch, Syria, Damas uh, 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 Damascus, and so on, and became Paulinized. So, yeah, I think Christian could be a parody of Sicari. 
Uh, one of my most, um, the reason I called this book here, The New Testament Code, is I was, uh, which I subtitled The Cup of the Lord, The Damascus Covenant, and the Blood of Christ. Because uh, the New Testament, the New Covenant, is something mentioned in the Damascus document of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in there, it's the New Covenant in the land of Damascus. So now, if you take, for instance, uh, and I describe that in great detail in this book, it's the final chapters, which is why I call it the New Testament Code, because New Testament, New Covenant are the same word. In Christianity, the Gospels, the New Covenant is the New Covenant in the blood of Christ, which follows uh, really the Pauline view of things in 1 Corinthians. So as it's put in the synoptics, uh, drink this in remembrance of me. This is the cup of the New Covenant in my blood. Okay, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in Damascus document particularly, which is why it's called the Damascus document by most scholars. These documents didn't have names. Scholars gave them names. It's talking about the new covenant in the land of Damascus. Now that, of course, parallels material in Acts about Damascus and so on. It's too complicated to talk about in a small discussion. But the new covenant in the land of Damascus, which is why I call it here the Damascus, the Damascus covenant. What is the new covenant in the land of Damascus? Of, of Damascus. It says it is to raise the holy things according to their precise specifications. It is the total opposite of the new covenant as presented in the Gospels and attributed to Jesus. The exact opposite. But go further. The new covenant in the land of Damascus. Jesus says, according to Paul in Corinthians and then the way the synoptics present him, this is the new covenant of my blood, in my blood. Drink this. Okay, oh, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink this. Okay, look at the word Damascus. Dam in Hebrew is blood. Kos in Hebrew is cup. Now, that, that parallel, that similarity, that I consider play on words, is so close as to be uh, almost un, undeniable. It, 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 it would, the, the, to be accidental, it would be like one in a hundred thousand possibilities that you could get such a close parallel. Which came first, the new covenant in the land of Damascus of the scrolls, or that in the 1 Corinthians or the Gospels? That's for people viewing uh, your um, presentation or reading books like mine or others. To, to, uh, to decide for themselves. I don't know which, which came first. I have my uh, suspicions on that. But then go further. Dam Damascus is a Greek word. The Hebrew is damashek. Okay, damashek. Dam mashke in Hebrew. Uh, mashke means give to drink. Give to drink. So it has both meanings. So when we have drink this in remembrance of me, we even have the Hebrew part of it. So when you're talking about play of words, to my mind, Damascus, and this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, those are total plays on words. And they love doing this kind of thing. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, one last point on playing on words in Hebrew. The, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the, we think the Pharisees as the seekers after smooth things. The seekers after smooth things. In Hebrew, smooth things is halakot. In rabbinic Judaism, coming from Phariseeism, they are looking for traditions. Seekers after halakot. And the Hebrew word for law is halakha from halakot. So we think in the scrolls they're laughing at the Pharisees by calling them seekers after halakot, not halakot. That is, playing on words. Playing on words was very widespread, very popular. I gave you two examples. One, Damascus and uh, Dam and Kos, cup of blood. And uh, two, Halachot, Halachot. Three, Sikari Christian. So what is, uh, what is the anti-Semitism in the, in the Gospels and in Paul's letters and so on? I mean, Paul in 1 Thessalonians says the Jews are the enemies of the whole human race. This is 2.15. Uh, it's in the, the anti-Semitic Peter in the book of Acts where negative Jewish things are constantly put into, anti-Jewish things are put into his mouth. 
the presentation of the Herodian family as a Jewish family. And finally, Jesus himself, who always seems to be preferring foreigners to um, Jews, uh, spitting on uh, Jewish groups, uh, uh, condemning them and so on, accepting Canaanites, uh, Phoenicians, Roman soldiers, uh, says if the things I said here had been said in Tyre and, Sus and Sidon, they would have long ago be be believed. And belief is the essence of, is the essence of Pauline theology. So I, I think basically we have a, uh, a, 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 Pauline, uh, a Paulinized Jesus in the scripture, and, and I can't vouch for its historicity. For instance, the uh, last episode like that, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Jesus is walking on the Sea of Galilee, and then Peter wants to walk too, or vice versa, Peter wants to walk on the Sea of Galilee, walk on the, uh, on the waters, and he sinks. And Jesus says to him, ah, oh, yes, you see, you sank for, because your faith was so weak. Who preaches faith? It's the Pauline doctrine of salvation by faith. Peter gets, for instance, in Acts, a Pauline-type tablecloth coming down from heaven. He said, no, I've never eaten any forbidden things. That's after Jesus dies. He's never heard that all things are, uh, are, are permitted. And uh, then uh, the voice cries out, eat, Peter, eat, three times. And then Peter says, ah, oh, I now know that there are no forbidden things. So uh, this is all Paulinization, and a lot of anti-Semitism comes in through this Paulinization. I could say, though, that, you know, if the Roman, if we can prove the Roman origins of Christianity, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, in the Western world uh, nothing left to, uh, to sustain us except uh, uh, some of the scroll type and other, other material.